Morning, Chris Hall, Wake Forest Baptist Health. So, uh, it's been two weeks since we've uh, had a, uh, a COVID update. A lot has happened in the last two weeks. Let's see if we can go through it. First of all, um, I think as most people know, uh, more COVID all across the whole United States, uh, including here in North Carolina and the triad. Um, if you are a follower of dashboards, I guess you could always be happy that um, per 100,000 people here in the triad, we have roughly five times less than the amount of COVID they have in Wisconsin or North Dakota or South Dakota or Iowa, uh, which are the real hotspots right now. Their numbers are up, uh, up around 130 to 140,000, 140 per 100,000 people, which is pretty high. Uh, hospitals in those areas are, uh, are stressed, I'll tell you, for, uh, quite frankly. Um, and uh, hospitals now in Wisconsin are having to cancel major surgeries. Uh, same in the Dakotas. It wouldn't surprise me if Iowa wouldn't be far behind. And this is so that they have uh, enough room to take care of people who have acute illness, including COVID. Um, it, it doesn't mean that people are uh, not getting taken care of. Um, they are there. Um, but it means that they're going to have to start doing some alternate care plans so that they have the ability to do that. Here, uh, here in, the, um, in our area, here in the triad, we're running roughly about 30 per 100,000 um, as far as cases go, um, which is about now in Forsyth County, about roughly about 120 to 130 per day if you're looking at absolute numbers. So quite a bit higher than they were in September. Um, but uh, not that much higher than they were when we peaked in July. Uh, while our hospitals are busy or emergency departments are busy, we have not had to do any alternate care plans here in North Carolina and uh, or pull different staffing situations so far. Um, um, we've been able to handle COVID um, in our area as we do um, with any, anything else. So. I implore people, don't delay your medical care. The hospitals are safe. Um, and uh, in fact, probably a lot safer than going to a Halloween party. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, <laughs> where uh, we've, we know how to take care of patients in hospitals so that COVID hasn't, uh, it doesn't transmit it between people. And while we do have uh, staff and workers who get COVID from time to time, um, by large, 98%, 99% of the time, they're getting it from their home situations and their social interactions and not at the workplace. So um, workplaces uh, can be safe and, and our hospitals are. Um, we, um, in our area, what's gonna happen in the next little bit? Well, we're gonna talk about Thanksgiving um, uh, in, a, in a few minutes um, and what the concerns are about Thanksgiving and what we might need to do um, to have a, have a safe Thanksgiving. Talk a little bit about Christmas too when we get into our questions. Um, I think our cases will, will slowly continue to go up in our area until um, we have something new and different that changes how we interact as people. Um, uh, still, and I bring this up almost every week, that where people are getting COVID are, are for the most part in small social situations. And it's always the, oh my gosh, what was I thinking moment afterwards? Um, hey, I thought it would be okay just to go out with another couple and, ha and have dinner at a restaurant. Dinner time, masks come down, transmission can occur. Most dinner tables in restaurants are less than six feet apart. Or, you know, I thought it would be great to have some friends over for, for a football party and a little bit of pizza. Um, you know, they're people I know. We run around them all the time. But they're not in your bubble. Um, and um, what happens is two days afterwards, you get the phone call. Hey, you know, I just tested positive. I don't feel horrible, but I just tested positive. You'll be getting a call. All of you are going to be in quarantine. And, um, and that's... Uh, that's not the way we want to spend our time. Um, so uh, those are things to think about. So um, I think I said two weeks ago what you need to do before having any kind of social interaction, anything. Think once, think twice, think three times, 
make a plan on how to do it safely. If you can't make a plan to do it safely, then you shouldn't do it. When you make a plan to do it safely, stick with the plan. So if you're going to have a fire pit out, pit out in outside with a few friends around the fire pit in the evening and it gets real cold, don't go inside and move it inside. You need to stick with the plan. Stay outside. Got to stay masked. Um, I think that uh, the more eating and drinking in your social interactions, the more likely that a transmission will occur. Um, so um, our schools, our schools are mostly, when they're having cases, um, well mostly, the, all, all, always so far, the ones I know of, it's, uh, it's people who are being um, infected in their home or in their social interaction and then they have to leave school or the stool has to do some contact tracing. So um, we haven't, um, to my knowledge, had any, in, in our area right here anyway, any real, um, any real transmissions in the school um, that have uh, had significant impact on anything. Um, the uh, universities, uh, for the most part, a lot of them are going to be uh, going home um, for Thanksgiving and then doing their last week or two afterwards virtually. It's just easier than North Carolina for those of you who are outside of the area. Um, it seems like every time I have a briefing we have bad weather. Two weeks ago it was a tropical storm. The, um, so anyway, uh, that's, uh, that's a little bit of the background about what's going on. Um, churches are still, we're still seeing outbreaks related in, to churches and places of worship. And, um, and I think that uh, the, the health departments are trying to reach out to them and, and have them show them how to do things that can be done more safely with distancing and masking. Um, while we all um, want to be able to continue to go to our places of worship. They are, uh, there are outbreaks that are being associated with them now. So if you're at high risk uh, for COVID, uh, this may be a time to watch virtually um, or, uh, or do it online um, rather than going in person. So uh, some other things that have come up uh, in the news a little bit off side of the, uh, of the risk area is, um, is what is, um, is uh, therapeutics um, and so two three days ago um, the FDA put out a new um, emergency use authorization for monoclonal antibodies these made by the company Lilly um, and what a monoclonal antibody is is basically an antibody made um, using biotechnology and an antibody is that thing that we make in our body that uh, is part of our immunity to fight disease. And essentially it's a protein that has two things that it can attach uh, to a virus or a germ. And when it attaches to it, it then drops it out of the circulation and gets it out of the body in conjunction with our own white blood cells. So if you make an antibody and you give it to somebody, you can create instant immunity. And that's anyway the uh, the idea behind it. Uh, so the monoclonal antibody made by Lilly uh, it has modest impact on COVID, but only if given in the first three days or so of infection. Um, and, uh, and so people who would get symptomatic would need to be tested um, and then get in for treatment quickly. Uh, there's not a lot of the monoclonal antibody available right now. Uh, the states are sending it out um, through health systems and to hospitals. Uh, and I can tell you the number of doses that are being distributed are extremely small. The emergency use authorization primarily um, has on its list people who have very high risk of getting severe COVID. Um, and for the most part, that's going to be people who are immunocompromised or potentially people who are older, like over 65, and have a lot of other medical problems at the same time. Um, so you, not everyone's going to be able to get the antibody initially. How well does it work? Well, it's modest. Um, and uh, if you get it in the first three days, 
it decreases your chances of being hospitalized from about 9% chance to about 3 to 4% chance. So while it could decrease your, your chance of being hospitalized or having to go in an emergency department, it's not a huge decrease. Um, so we still need better therapeutics, we need better drugs. The monoclonal antibody is not, not the magic bullet, it's not the answer. Um, what I'm waiting for are, tri are drugs that are in trials that are like Tamiflu, for flu. Uh, you can take a pill, actually go get it at a pharmacy um, and you take it and you can take it very early that way. The monoclonal antibody you have to get a, by a vein infusion uh, and it takes about three hours to do the whole process. You have to be watched for an hour after you get it um, because sometimes people have reactions from it. So um, it's, a, it's a little bit hard to get um, right now because of numbers and it's a little bit, um, uh, um, I would say, arduous uh, to get the infusion. Um, the other really good news and, and what I'm optimistic about is, um, is the report about um, Pfizer's um, uh, vaccine efficacy. So roughly 90% efficacy. So what does 90% efficacy mean is that um, you, the vaccine itself causes a 90% reduction uh, in infection, um, particularly for severe infection. And um, this is based on, on a small number of people still who got COVID who were in the trial. Um, and the reason why we heard about the results now rather than earlier or rather than later is that for in order to show that the vaccine works, you have to have enough people in the trial get COVID to know if how much the vaccine protects you relative to a placebo. And uh, that number came up last week. And we thought it was gonna actually come up more around the first week of December, but because there's so many more cases of COVID out there in the country, um, we hit the target a little bit earlier. Um, so, uh, so what are the next steps with that? Well, we need to complete the clinical trial to make sure that the early results are, um, are collaborated by the later results. And then we also need a few pe more people in the trial um, so that we know uh, that, uh, that we have safety. And you have to follow people who've gotten the vaccine for a certain number of weeks afterwards uh, to get the full safety data in. So we hope to have that roughly the first week of December, so maybe the last week of November. And then, um, and then uh, we'll start, they'll start production and distribution. So the way the vaccine will get distributed is uh, basically it'll go from uh, the company uh, through the states um, and then the states will take their allotment and distribute it out to uh, distribution centers um, that are out, scattered about the state. And so um, the way that's done is you need to have a really, really cold freezer, what we call a minus 70 or minus 80 freezer to keep this vaccine stable. And so it'll go to, to places that have those big freezers and then from there, it'll get distributed out for the geographic area around that distribution center. Um, and, uh, and it'll be done so daily because you have about a day once the vaccine leaves that freezer to get it into people. So people would have their vaccine events you know, on, on a daily basis scheduled or the clinic will know how many they're gonna give on a certain daily basis and then it'll just get distributed out from that regional area. Uh, and then that way not everyone has to buy a minus 80 freezer, which are a little hard to get right now uh, and kind of expensive. So, um, so that's, uh, that's how it's done. Unfortunately, the, you have to have that freezer though if you're gonna store the vaccine for more than just a, a few days, a day or two because it's, um, um, the vaccine is a messenger RNA vaccine and that has to be kept really cold or it, uh, it degrades. So uh, um, why, why is the vaccine out now um, so quickly? Um, so, you know, normally it takes years and years and years to make a vaccine. This one we got out in a, in a, in a matter of months. Um, so there's a few reasons. One is, is that it, there was, a, you know, a lot of time and effort put into it and resources to get it done more quickly. 
too is it's done with different technology now. In the old days, we used to use things even like eggs to grow up virus and then make vaccines from that and or live tissue cultures. And this is all made using biotechnology. Um, and it's just simply our technology is so much better now um, and our science in the laboratory and for, me, for vaccine productions come so far in the last five or six years. So it really is a triumph um, of technology over virus. Um, and um, there'll be more vaccines coming out. You'll be hearing about Moderna's vaccine in a little bit, uh, if you, in a week or two, because they're about ready to, to, uh, to um, um, publish their interim analysis on their efficacy. I'm guessing it won't be too different from Pfizer's, so probably somewhere up around 90%. Uh, it's made kind of the same way Pfizer's vaccine is. It's also a messenger RNA vaccine. And so I, I think we'll have two good vaccines. Um, when uh, will people start getting it? Probably sometime around Christmas, um, end of the year, beginning the next year. Healthcare workers will get it first, staff in nursing homes um, and uh, nursing home residents. Uh, and then we kind of go down the list. The more likely you are to have severe COVID, the higher up you're on the priority list. We'll be vaccinating through the whole year. It's going to take a while to do this. So um, I, I'm really confident, though, that this is going to be a safe and effective vaccine. And then it's going to help get our immunity up in our population. And uh, together with um, our other measures that we use, um, hopefully, uh, by this time next year, um, we won't be in such a severe situation with COVID as we are now. The, um, the thing about once vaccine comes out is people are still going to be asked to socially distance, personally distance, and wear masks because it's going to take a while. And the vaccine won't have 100% protection for 100% of people. So we need to do both. If you can bring down the amount of COVID this much by vaccine and you can bring it down this much by your social and personal distancing and masking, then together you'll have synergy to bring it down even further. So it's going to be, it's going to be a three-legged stool between masking, personally distancing vaccine, and then you can toss in a little bit of herd immunity from people who already have gotten the, the, the virus. So, um, so that's uh, the story with vaccine. Um, a couple things, because um, uh, I'm going to go ahead and start um, going through questions that we've been getting. And a lot of these pertain to, to Thanksgiving and Christmas. So we'll bring that up. But the first one I have is from Richard Craver. Any concern that Halloween parties may be causing the recent surge? Well, they're not causing the recent surge, but they've contributed to it. Um, a Halloween party is just a, another example of a social interaction where people get COVID at. Um, so uh, I've had Halloween parties um, come up in conversations and contact tracing um, several times, um, both with uh, young people and with older people. Um, and, um, and so yes, it has contributed to our cases uh, recently. And, um, and so we don't want the same thing to happen with Thanksgiving um, because that's another time when social and family interactions get together. So let's take some questions. So Michelle asks, how and when should we get tested to meet up with family for Thanksgiving? Is the rapid testing accurate enough? Well, first of all, the best thing you can do to have a safe Thanksgiving is to do it with your immediate family and people you're around all the time. That's your bubble, okay? So the more bubbles you bring in, which are other groups of people into your bubble, the more opportunities you have for virus to get into your bubble because other people can have it asymptomatically. And, and the situation again will be, you know, your cousin Eddie will come down and have Thanksgiving with you guys and, and two or three other families that have, you know, you know have within your family and you all get together and you got 20 people for a meal um, and um, and then cousin Eddie calls you on Monday and says I'm not feeling so well I got tested I'm positive and now there's people who've been transmitted to in that situation 
So, um, so if you're going to get together with other family members, my recommendation is is to limit it to one other bubble, and um, and that um, and that you know uh, the people and they have the same risk mindset. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about how about quarantining before visiting in a minute, um, but uh, that's the best way. So, testing can help you have a safe get together, but it is not by itself enough. And um, and I, so witness what happened at the White House. Everyone who got into the White House got tested before their before their problems. And so you can have people who can sneak in who have COVID and the test isn't, um, isn't um, sensitive enough to pick it up very early on. And so it can still happen. Um, and uh, so if you're going to get tested, you're going to want to get tested at least within the 72 hours before you travel for Thanksgiving. And then you're still going to want to socially distance. You're going to still have to wear your mask. So it, it doesn't really change your behavior and what you're going to do. So testing adds to the safety. It doesn't replace masking and personal distancing for safety. And of course, you're still going to want to be doing hand hygiene all the time. So um, I would say it's within 72 hours. You asked the question, is the rapid testing? I assume you mean the antigen accurate enough? You know, it's not approved for doing it in asymptomatic people, and occasionally we run into false positives in that group. I'd probably ask for a PCR if I was going to do that. So testing adds to your safety. It does not replace the other things you're going to do, and that's important to remember. Um, Natalia um, asks, um, and Christine asks similar questions. What is the safest way to have college students come back home for the holidays? Uh, we have two high-risk people in our home. Is it safe for our daughter to fly home for Christmas? So um, the safest thing to do, and the message we're trying to get out to the colleges is one, uh, if you're a college student, chill out for the two weeks before you go. Lay low, go to class, study, and skip the social stuff, skip the bars, um, skip the parties um, and, and, um, and be boring for two weeks before you go home for Thanksgiving. Uh, and it's really important. And parents can help get that message out too to their children, um, although college students wouldn't want to be called that, uh, but to get to, to your students that you have out studying or at college, let them know that you expect them to lay low and chill for two weeks. Uh, no parties, no socializing, no bars, no big lunch or dinner get-togethers, study and go to class. Those are the safe things to do. Um, maybe watch a movie here and there in your own room by yourself. Um, you get the idea. Um, so it, that's the first thing you can do. College students can get uh, tested before they go home. Again, you'd probably want to do it within a week or so before you leave. And if you've been, um, if you've been doing um, you know, things that are safe and not social and you get tested within the week before you go, um, things should be good. Um, and uh, once they get to your home, you'll still kind of want to have them um, sequester themselves a little bit. And while you're getting together um, for, and chatting in the evening or doing things to, um, to mask. Um, until um, you know some time has gone by ultimately two weeks and then you know everybody's safe now after that they're in your bubble and it's a one bubble situation and you're fine so um, uh, Suzette asks if we quarantine for two weeks and another family does the same is it safe to get together at Christmas? How stringent should the quarantine be since it means different things to different people? Well, we just talked about that a little bit. How stringent do you, do you want it to be? The big things to lay off are, are social interactions, having meals with other people, um, and, and, and having bubble fusions, so to speak. So that's the big thing. Um, I don't think the quarantine has to be so strict that you order out food only to be delivered to your house and you don't leave your house for two weeks. But, um, it, but um, I think most people by now are kind of figuring out 
what the higher risk things are to do and, and that's to avoid it. Think once, think twice, think three times, make a plan and stick to the plan. Um, and um, and that's, uh, that's what you should do for those two weeks. Um, then, um, and then I think it is okay to get together um, for Christmas. Um, so traveling by air is, um, is probably um, not quite as safe as traveling by car. You have considerations for both things. The airplane itself is probably not a big, big problem. It's the airports and the bathrooms and the restaurants and the getting food in the airport. Flight gets canceled, you have to sit around, you get hungry, you get more food, it gets crowded in the gateway, so on and so forth. So it's the airport situation. So try to keep your flights uh, down to one, one leg and keep the duration down. And if, um, if something gets canceled, find a place to sit that's out and away from other people, particularly if you have to bring your mask down to eat or drink. Airports do have quiet places, you just have to search them out sometimes to find them. Um, traveling by car, the, obviously the car itself is not a problem unless you're traveling with other people. So if you and your brother Rick want to get together and travel together for uh, going to Thanksgiving, you got to ask brother Rick, what have you been doing? Um, you know, and because um, and in the car, uh, you're in a real tight bubble. And, uh, and so it's safest to mask if you're traveling with people who aren't in your immediate household. It feels odd, it doesn't feel normal, but it's the safest thing to do. Obviously when you're going in to get snack or uh, to use the restroom, uh, when you're driving, uh, hand sanitize before going in, hand sanitize when you come out. Um, and, then, um, and that uh, gets the germs off the hands if you pick something up when you are in there. Um, Gail asks, I have been offered a COVID test, the spit test, and if it's negative, can I visit within 24 my hours? My mother who lives in an independent living apartment and retirement community, would it be safe for me to visit her and can I hug her? Again, the test adds to safety, um, but you're gonna wanna do other things. Hugging, um, I don't know, it would be nice. Um, if you're gonna hug, keep the hug down in duration and have a real nice hand sanitized before you do it uh, and wear a mask um, and have your mother wear a mask when you do it. Um, so um, personal contact obviously increases the risk a bit. So the test adds to the safety, it doesn't replace the safety. It doesn't mean you're A-OK. -okay. Um, so I, I can tell you a story about um, a group of young people who um, who decided that they wanted to go out and spend a night on the town. And so they, um, they all got tested before they went. Two days before they went, they all got tested, found out the day they went that that test was negative. And then it turns out that one of them actually converted that morning and exposed all his friends and four other people got COVID from that night out. So they would say, but yeah, we were all tested. Sometimes it happens, it can sneak up on you. Um, Colleen says, I'm a specialist teacher in the very high risk health category. I'm being asked to go into class and use the class microphone around my neck and share technology devices. How can I stay safe while spending 45 minutes at a time in each classroom? Well, you know, the way we do classrooms is the students all stay masked, they all stay distant um, as much as they can. The teacher's usually up at the front of the room and well within, I mean, further apart than six feet. Sometimes there's plexiglass between them and, and the class. And then, and then if you're using a mic, the mic itself turns out isn't much of a problem and a lot of, uh, a lot of the schools and universities are, are disinfecting the mic beforehand, um, which can be done. Um, and, uh, and then I would hand sanitize before you go in to do the teaching and then once you're done teaching that class I would hand sanitize afterwards um, and, um, and I would wear the mask um, while you're teaching as long as it doesn't interfere with your ability to communicate you can just leave it on. CDC just uh, really formally put it on their web page this week that masks not only keep you from giving COVID to other people but it helps protect you 
from the other people too. So it goes both ways with masks. Kathy asks, is there a connection between COVID and a vitamin D deficiency? A lot written about that lately. Maybe, um, I don't think the studies are conclusive yet. If you're gonna think of taking a vitamin D supplement, um, you know, I would do it per recommended doses and don't overdo it. You know, I'm originally from Wisconsin, so I think a really big glass of milk every day will go a long ways. So, and it's got vitamin D. Uh, Laura, please offer some advice on exposure. If someone in the household tests positive, should you get tested or wait for symptoms? Should you quarantine? Are you safe to be around others if everyone's wearing a mask? Okay, so if someone in your household tests positive, you are in quarantine. Yeah. And, um, and most of the time you're gonna get a phone call at some point from the health department with contact tracing because that positive test triggers that. So um, if you get an odd phone number on your phone and it's ringing for a while, go ahead and answer that, even though it still could be the person trying to tell you that your vehicle's warranty needs to be extended. Um, but, uh, but sometimes it's the health department calling, trying to get the, the contact tracing done. So answer the phone. Um, and then you need to stay quarantined. Um, if you get tested and the test is negative, you're still in quarantine if you're a household exposure. It doesn't change um, your quarantine situation. Um, the, if the test is positive, then it helps us extend the contact tracing out. But a negative test doesn't, doesn't mitigate quarantine, at least not right now. Um, are you safe to be around others if everyone's wearing a mask? Uh, if you're wearing a mask and they're wearing a mask and you're trying to stay away from people and limit the duration of contact, um, then the, yes, you can still stay in the household. You don't have to go get a hotel room or something like that. Um, again, it's meals that are the biggest problem because the masks come down. So if somebody in your household tested positive, they should take their meals by themselves. Um, and um, the good old TV dinner. So um, Paula asked in the past, oh, I asked, answered this question earlier. Paula asked if it, how, how our, come vaccines could be made so quickly now, and a lot of it's just because our technology is so much better. Science moves forward. You know, when it's back in 1890, it would take you five days to travel from Winston-Salem to Atlanta. Now you can do it in an hour and a half on a plane. So technology speeds things up. So anyway, Thanksgiving's coming up. Start making your plans. Please make safe plans. Um, and, uh, and remember, bubble fusing, uh, keep it to a minimum. And uh, think once, think twice, think three times. Make a plan and stick to it. So with that, I'll go ahead and tie it up until next week. <laughs>